Hi, my name is Jordan Alicio. I'm the General Manager for ABC Bullion Australia. Pleasure to uh, welcome Jasper Crawley. Jasper's from the World Gold Council. He's the Head of Institutional Relationships across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we're filming here today on the 17th of November. Jasper, thanks for coming along and what brings you to Australia? Oh, a pleasure. Um, always good to be in Australia. I think it's the third time I've been here this year. Um, look, look, I work in a region from Japan all the way down to here, everything in between, uh, but not China and not India. Uh, and my role is really building uh, relationships with institutional investors and explaining, you know, why gold. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, look, let's delve straight into that. Uh, since the start of November, gold has had a, a really nice rally on, in most currencies, but let's yeah. uh, focus on US dollars for now. It's up roughly 8%, let's call it, 120 odd dollars an ounce and now back above $1,750. Yeah. Uh, what do you think has been the main driver of that? And do you think this sort of that has brought to an end this corrective period gold's been in for some time? Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, so, so look, you and I actually spoke about this two weeks ago um, we were, when we were in a meeting, and it was a really interesting setup for gold. Um, on the kind of micro level, uh, we had things like the Commitment of Traders report, which had the market net short, right? So that, that, that basically means the financial drivers of gold were negative. And so those sort of macro funds that look at rates, uh, particularly US rates, look at the, the, the US currency. We're yep. thinking these are too strong, rates are too high. Um, so I'm going to be short gold here. So they were net short, moving into a period where a huge amount of physical buying was going on. And this was really spotted, I would say this would be spotted by the commodity funds and the guys that look at this stuff closely. They'd have been seeing a lot of bars being sold out of London, right, moving to refineries in Switzerland, being cast into kilo bars and moving east into Asia. Sure. Uh, and, and what I think we've seen is a lot of long-term buying, buying that means that gold isn't coming back to the market anytime soon. And that's right? been the story of this year where sort of, for, for oversimplification maybe, but Western investors, whether they're using the futures market, using gold ETFs, largely disinterested, or as you, you said, even short in some cases, whereas Eastern buying, buying physical bars, coins, central banks, which we'll get into, yeah. that's actually been really strong, right? Yeah, yeah, totally agree, yeah. I mean, uh, I, th I think let's, let's look at Q3, right, the latest quarter. Um, we saw over 200 tonnes of ETF you know, supply into the market, right, selling. Sure. Yeah. And at the same time, in the physical side and the retail side, and, and maybe you can testify to this, we saw, we think, over 350 tonnes of bar and coin demand. Sure, right? so, sure. So, so it's these smaller buyers, but a huge amount of them yeah. sucking up that gold, yeah. right? And the big guys, probably the institutional guys that I'm meant to be getting to buy gold, actually selling gold. Yeah. Um, so, but, but net net, you can see that the number meant that there was more buying than selling. Sure. Right? So you've got guys short, huge amount of buying going on, and that is you know, a pretty good catalyst, I'd say, for, for at some point a sharp move higher. And that's what we spoke about two weeks ago. Yeah, that's sort of how it's played out mm. so far. And, yeah. and look, certainly can uh, you know, attest to the fact that retail demand is, is very, very strong. Demand across our distributor network as well, who are dealing with their own retail investors, it's, it's very strong too. So yeah, obviously, you know, 2022, if you were you know, in the ETF space, probably hasn't been great yep. uh, you know, for a, a gold ETF issuer, but certainly yep. for those of us that uh, are more focused yeah. on the, the end physical investor. Agreed. It's been very robust. Yeah, I, I'd, say, I'd say a couple more things because um, you can break it down regionally. Sure. Uh, and so the, the US market's been particularly tough, right, particularly on the, on, on the ETF side. And, and that makes sense, right? Because they've had a strong dollar, um, high interest rates. If you look at something like the European market, actually net we're up this year for ETF demand. Yep. Um, and you imagine that they've got you know, a war on their doorstep. Um, and the, and inflation, yeah, to rates. totally. But, and they've also got a central bank that is walking a serious tightrope there. Um, tighten too much, and they could tank the economy. They leave it too loose, you know, and, and inflation becomes yeah, unanchored and probably totally. largely is already. Yeah. And that's actually an interesting point because even when we, you know, if you read most headlines this year, the last couple of weeks notwithstanding, it's generally focused on gold not doing as well as people might have thought, given where inflation is. But actually. That's really only a US dollar story, right? And Australian dollars, euro, sterling, yen, gold's actually done pretty well. Yeah, totally. So, so um, you had a conversation with John Reid, I think, back in September. And, and I always remember, he, you know, he's our chief market strategist. Uh, and he makes this point. A lot of people ask him, why isn't gold higher this year? And exactly that. They point to the war and things like that. Um, and he always says that the better question is, why isn't gold lower this yeah. year? And that is the question asked really by people that model gold and particularly put emphasis as drivers on gold as the dollar and rates. 
and probably tips, you know, so, something uh, kind of real yield um, uh, as a driver. Um, and when you look at models that, that only have, you know, dollar index and tips, for example, as a driver, you know, they would model gold significantly lower than it is yeah, at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so the big question on their mind is what's going on there? Um, is that relationship between real yields and gold still a viable relationship? And look, I, I think we think it is. Um, when you look at the day, you know, the sort of daily correlation, it's still pretty good. Um, but there has appeared to be a bit of a gap, right? So, so real yields have, have jumped higher, and gold hasn't fallen as much dived as, as exactly yeah. as people expected. I think one of the really interesting things for in this inflation debate, and, and there's a chart that we sort of update on a semi-regular basis. We might do it as part of this interview as well. Is we we look at the gap between current headline inflation and the sort of 10-year break-even inflation rate yeah. in terms of what the market's expecting, and yeah. that. The gap between those two has just gone up and up and up this year, which is a function of inflation itself rising, um, whereas the 10-year break-even's actually gone down this year. So right. it's this fascinating mismatch now where actually market participants, they actually really still think, you know, on balance, they actually still think inflation's a transitory phenomenon. So from my point of view, the bad news around that has kind of already been priced into gold. It can only get better for gold in that regard from here, or, or the risk is certainly to, to the upside. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, you were talking about the recent pot we had in gold. So, so and, I, and I mentioned a couple of the kind of commodity drivers that we noticed. Um, and a really interesting one is looking at the 20-year break-evens. They jumped, before gold moved, they jumped 50 basis points, sure. which, is, which is a big move for yeah. something that far out. Uh, and at the same time, you'd had some weaker data uh, on the housing in the U.S., and I think, yeah, market participants are thinking, okay, so how much can they really hike here? And is inflation going to become a problem? So, um, look, in the short term, we appear to have quite high inflation. But as you say, the market isn't really pricing in that much inflation subsequently. Yeah. And if that changes, then, yeah, that, that could be quite meaningful. Yeah, it's interesting, the, the concept about how far the Fed or any other central bank can, can tighten, that's really relevant here. In fact, the RBA was one of the first central banks that probably surprised the market on the dovish side. They only hiked by 25 mm. basis points. Um, two meetings back, followed yep. it up with another 25 uh, at their most recent meeting. I think had they gone 50 before, they'd have gone 50 again because the inflation data is actually surprised to yep. the upside and some of the economic data is still strong enough. Yep. But I think where, you know, if central banks haven't completely pivoted yet, it feels like they're sort of at, at, on the verge of yeah. beginning to pivot. Um, or at least starting to think about it because the economic data is starting to deteriorate a little bit. Yeah, yeah. so um, you know, there's only so long you can you know, blame supply bottlenecks. At some point, they might want to look at how much money they've pumped in over COVID. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think they're walking a, a tricky, thin, fine line at the moment. Um, don't know where it goes, but, but it's probably, probably a good point uh, or a good time to talk about gold and other currencies. Yeah, well, because as you mentioned, you, the Aussie dollar and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you can jump into that. And the other one I wanted to talk about, and this is probably particularly relevant given you know your role talking to institutional investors, is maybe the way they're starting to think about gold now. Yeah. You know, the bonds aren't providing the kind of diversification quality they used to. Um, you know, retail investors don't tend to buy bonds directly anyway. Yes. Um, but do you want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, look, I, th I think the you've got the classic 60-40 portfolio, right? So, so I think most people will be familiar, but the idea that you can own 60% of equities and the other 40% of your portfolio put in bonds. And these things have been negatively correlated. So at times when equities are up, your bonds haven't performed so well, you can rebalance and vice versa. That has worked really, really well over the last 20 years. Um, the difference between now and the last 20 years is that inflation is now, you know, I think we have sort of 3% as a kind of turning point where it starts to be a little bit more meaningful. Um, inflation in the short term is much higher than that. Uh, and what we've seen, therefore, is a much hardening up of this correlation. As inflation's got higher, the, the correlation between bonds and equities has flipped from being a negative correlation to a positive correlation. Yeah. And what that means is, yeah, is that if you have the 60... On, yeah, losing with both. Classic, yeah. So, so, so you're losing on both. And I think the point that, that we have been making to institutional investors is that when you're building your, you know, the sort of building blocks of your portfolio, that foundation, that's when you should think about gold. So you should have, of course, some money in equities, of course, some money in fixed income, but maybe gold should be... Strategic holding yeah, in the portfolio. Like, and, and of course, you know, it depends what you have in that portfolio as to how much you would own. But, you know, over, at most portfolios we've looked at, 
it's around five to seven percent. Interestingly, in Australia, uh, when we looked at we looked at a, a portfolio from uh, APRA, sure, um, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, um, the kind so of classic large yeah, superannuation, yeah, funds. Exactly, exactly, like a standard yeah. portfolio, and actually we found that, that the holdings should be even higher, yeah, um, because of the amount of risk they've had, yeah, uh, and these guys have been adding more and more equities to their portfolio well, I was, I was going to say, over the last few years. Compared to North America, particularly Europe, APRA regulated super funds tend to have much larger weightings to equities than right. um, you know, the North American European counterparts have heavier fixed income weightings. Yeah. Um, so that, look, that, that makes total sense. And I guess there's always that difference between, and I'm sort of now thinking back to my old days working in institutional asset yeah. management. Um, you know, when, you're, when you're a super fund or a pension portfolio, you're managing billions of dollars, so the sort of opportunity set available is much wider and more and deeper than it is if you're an individual investor managing, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, yep. for example. So, one of the things we find is that when we're talking to direct investors, say someone just managing their own pension money, self-managed super fund, yep. they tend to have much higher weightings to gold, and that's because gold is playing a role. That, that you know, a super fund might think they can get part of that from yes, other assets. Fair enough. Whereas yeah. if you're, you know, if you, say if you've got a portfolio of a few hundred thousand dollars, you're not allocating to unlisted infrastructure or hedge funds or private yep. equity. Um, probably not to crypto, especially after you know recent market moves as well. So I think that's always important to to keep in mind. Just just sort of feeding on from this institutional space because I think it's a really fascinating one for the the sort of future of gold demand and, and therefore potentially the price. What do you see as the key difference between the way, say, uh, institutional investors in Asia versus, say, Europe versus, say, North America yep. tend to look at gold from a portfolio yeah, perspective? Yeah, uh, it's, it's particularly moving to Asia. Uh, I've been, uh, how would I put it, surprised by the stark differences, actually. Um, so, so North America, you know, very macro-driven currency rates. Sure. Europe, um, like, like we've seen, it is currency and rates, but it's obviously a different currency, right? So, so this year, in euros, uh, I reckon they're up to sort of six, seven percent um, versus in America, where the dollar price is down about three percent. So in Europe, you've seen it just means they're a bit warmer to gold. Sure. And they've they've also got a wall right on their doorstep. So, so I think from that perspective, uh, they've also had negative rates for a while. So, whilst you know people talk about gold as a commodity, um, you wrap it as an ETF, and suddenly people talk about gold as an equity. Uh, in Europe, people are talking about gold as a fixed income instrument because it's got a better yield than bond, or at least it did a year ago. Sure. Which is kind of interesting. Uh, moving further east to... Well, I was going to say, yeah. as a quickly as yeah. a comment, if, if I think back again to, to you know, what I used to do before I was directly in the bullion industry, I always found that fixed income people tended to have a better appreciation for gold because they kind of, they could model it or at least think about it, like yeah. a sort of zero coupon, zero credit risk instrument, as it yeah. were. Yes. Um, whereas, no, it, it, it's not a, a, this is not a pejorative statement at all, yeah. but for equities people, it it sort of makes less sense. It's intuitive. probably a diversifier yeah. for them. Yeah. Uh, but le yeah, less so, I think, that the, the credit risk angle, which I think is a really important angle that drives, you know, part of the way it behaves. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, back into but yeah, Asia so, Pacific. So, yeah, so back into Asia Pacific. So, so they're moving over here. Uh, Starting with Japan, really interesting. The Japanese, at least that we're speaking to, look at gold on a really long-term basis, right? So, so if you said to them, let's talk about the dollar, let's talk about rates, they don't really go there. They're really interested in supply and demand. Right. Um, and to me, that says these guys are looking at it, yeah, really long-term. Um, so, so hopefully, you know, it's a strategic asset for them. Um, and then if you think what's happened this year with the yen, Right, actually, you know, it's, it's gold in, in, in yen has performed even better than gold in sterling. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's, which is, much, you know, <laughs> it's probably like the leading nice developed market to, currency performance. Yeah, 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 close so, to it. Yeah, 17% yeah. Um, year to date. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of managers, I think, I think that's really saved them. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's been a good performance for them. Um, where it goes from here, I mean, I think you could potentially flip a coin on the yen, but I think the yen, obviously, the, the, the strength of their currency or weakness will be a big driver um, looking ahead. And, and probably last one on, on, on the Insto space, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about crypto because I think the the gap between gold and crypto is fairly well established this year yeah. after, FDX is out. Uh, after everything that's, that's happened to, yes. to Bitcoin and yeah. probably more broadly the, the crypto ecosystem. But is that actually, does that come up with the, the conversations with Instos where they're sort of saying, you know, they're looking at gold versus crypto or not really at all? They sort of still see crypto so, as Yeah, it's a huge separate. amount, I think, is made of it by the media. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is made by the crypto industry yeah. who look at 
you know, I think they got to over a trillion dollars in that market. And then they looked to gold Easy and thought, point, well, they've yeah. got nine, 11 trillion, whatever it is. Yeah. We would like our market to be that size. So why don't we keep making comparisons? Yeah. Um, and there are a couple of comparisons, right? Um, both finite assets. So there'll be 21 million Bitcoins will ever be mined. Um, a bit like in gold, theory. right? In theory, yeah, unless the software change. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, same with gold, right? There's yeah. a finite amount in the world. Um, uh, and then the second thing is this idea that they're out, out of reach of central bankers. Uh, and I think that appeals to a, a certain, certain clientele. demographic. Yeah, exactly, a certain clientele. Yeah. So um, those are, yeah, but you know, beyond that, right, you, you can, A, you can say, well, how many other coins are there? Right? Yeah. They're not necessarily finite because someone will just invent, you know, we'll create another one. Just um, one. Yeah, but, but I think the, the most important thing to do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can, yeah. Anyway, I won't start advertising that. Um, the most important thing to think about is, is like, how does this thing behave? And, you know, is, if it's a replacement for gold, it should therefore be a diversifier and behave like gold. And, yeah. and what we found, you know, we, we've, written, track, yeah, right? like we've written, yeah, we've written a paper on this. Um, we found that comparing it to the NASDAQ, right, um, on a day when the NASDAQ is down by two standard deviations, right, gold will be up over 80% of the time. Yeah. So gold is really helping you yeah. when your other stuff's being hurt. Yeah. Um, on those days, I think, I th Bitcoin was down like 55% of the time or, yeah, or up 55% yeah, yeah. of the time. But yeah. basically it was sort of hit and miss. Yeah. Um, so is, this, you know, is it going to diversify your portfolio? We found that it was a 1% allocation to um, the FANG stocks, right? In yeah. terms of risk. Uh, or sorry, 1% allocation to Bitcoin was like a 7% allocation to the FANG stocks. Yeah. In terms of the risk you're adding to your portfolio. Yeah. Um, and then finally, like sharp ratios and things like that. Um, we, we basically found that you add gold to a portfolio, it'll diversify your portfolio, and that's why it improves your Sharpe ratio. When you add Bitcoin to your portfolio, the returns are so high that even though it increases your overall volatility in your portfolio, the returns have been so ridiculous that it does also improve your Sharpe ratio, but for totally different reasons to go. Yeah. So you just need to understand the, I, the difference. I think there's one thing to talk about there in this context as well. There's a, there's a great saying that I'm very fond of, which is, um, not everything that matters can be counted and not everything that can be counted matters. And so one of the things with Bitcoin is that it's kind of cool that there's this, there's this very complete performance history from the sort of mining of the first coin. Yep. And that then allows people to model, you know, returns, risk, interaction with other assets, you name it. But the reality is, so you can count it, right? Right, yeah. But does it really matter? Because when it started, it had a, it had a market value of like a dollar, right? Yeah. Well, so if its yeah. market value goes from a dollar to two dollars, you can say, wow, the performance of this thing's a hundred percent. Yeah. But it went up by a dollar. That's that's completely meaningless to the whole world, let alone you know, especially institutional yeah. investors. And I think that's one of the things that you know needs to be bought, like, kind of kept in mind when it comes to crypto. Is it's so new and it's so tiny still as an asset class that. The idea, like, like it's it's fun to sort of model it in and amongst other asset classes, yeah. but it just doesn't have the depth or the liquidity or the history or really the the, the ecosystem around it yeah. to really say, okay, can I really have confidence modeling this alongside treasuries, equities, yeah. gold? I mean, you don't know the data, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It goes well, back to two thousand nine or something. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Tough might one. might switch gears for you. I'm just conscious of time as yeah. well. One thing that's you know increasingly important for you know a, a growing subset of investors and, and, and the like is you know let, let's let's call it ESG um, as a as a, a you yeah. know, high level a statement blanket, yeah. um, as it were yeah. or, or an umbrella I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I you know from my point of view I think gold has you know particularly Australian gold yeah. has wonderful ESG credentials. Do you do you want to talk a little bit about that in the context of Technology and provenance, and how the World Gold Council and yeah, I mean, member companies look at it. Yeah, I th I look, it's, I mean, it's hugely important to my CEO um, that the provenance of gold is tracked. Um, I think you should shout about gold in Australia. Um, you know, I, th I think it is green and gold, and um, you know, as your national colours, I think that's yes. honestly, I think that's fantastic. Um, but but yeah, so it's hugely important to our CEO. Um, he, you know, he's working on. You can look on our website, something called Gold Two Four Seven, and you can see that that you know, whilst whilst we're keen to differentiate gold from something like Bitcoin, the application of blockchain may be really useful in this in order to track the provenance of gold right from mine all the way into, you know, your in refinery, for example. Or... Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so, so, so that's something that we're working on. And I think, yeah, that, that comes into, that'll touch on the environmental um, and social, you know, aspects of gold. Um, and then when I think about, 
uh, perhaps you know regional differences again um, in Australia a huge focus on the on the e right so the work that the miners are doing here and around the world who are our members in terms of reducing their carbon emissions right so, so first thing we did was say right we need to we need to figure out what the emissions are we think that 04 percent of global emissions is, is the gold mining industry um, you could compare that to cement which is seven percent yeah, wow. well yeah so, so you know still it's high I think point, point four is high um, and then what they're doing to try and try and reduce that um, so they are I mean I, I met with a with a miner in Brisbane who's just spent one and a half million dollars on a digger an electric digger in order to de-diesel fire the mine right, right to reduce CO2 emissions um, you know they're all aiming for 2050 to be carbon neutral we've written a paper you can look at it on our website where we think it's possible they could do it by 2040 we could make the the, the industry uh, carbon neutral uh, and the importance is that when you're looking at a bar of gold, 99% of the emissions come from mining and refining. And actually, I think it's 98% is, is mining. And, mine, uh, yeah, mine. 1%, sure. only 1% is refining. So you fix mining, you fix the problem. Sure, sure. And look, as a, as a final comment, I suppose, or question for you, obviously we've had this nice bounce now. This is not asking you for a price prediction by any means here, because um, I wouldn't give one either. Yeah. But, you know, maybe back to the first question I asked, it sort of feels to me now like we're at, at least probably through the worst of this corrective period that, that's gone back a couple of years in US dollar gold. Yeah. What's your sort of outlook as we as we head into 2023? Yeah, so so we never really touched on the central bank buying. And I and I think that's a huge part of how I think about the future, which is just this idea that a huge amount of buying has taken place somewhere around somewhere under seventeen hundred, right? Sure. Uh, Metals Focus who who produced data for us estimate 399 tons of, of gold was bought by central banks in the last quarter. Now that number could be revised. Um, and it, it's and, and it is, yeah, and it is an estimate, but yeah, something has to balance the books and, and they do follow trade flows, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you know, so, so there's a pretty decent uh, bid down there. Um, that having been, you know, that, that gold having been taken out of the market, probably going somewhere for the long term, uh, financials having been short, um, you know, that, that's created a, a really nice bounce, um, very short term. You know, I look at things like RSIs, they're looking a little bit toppy at the moment. Um, do I think, it's a tricky one, do, do I think gold can go down to 1600? Like, look, I don't know. I, I, th I just think there's so many uncertainties out there at the moment. All right, war, uh, US interest rates, if they go too high, then they're going to cause a, you know, a, an issue, a potential recession in the US. If they cause a recession in the US, what, US, what happens to the dollar? Um, you know, there's a number of things, number of factors that that warrant gold being looked at, and we think retained in a portfolio. Yeah, look, I think that's a great answer, and I'll, I'll actually um, I picked up something on Twitter this morning um, that your colleague John wrote. Yeah. Um, where he said, you know, the most interesting times in gold tend to be where Western investors are sort of either short or disinterested for yeah. Western financial investors, so ETF and futures market users or participants. Um, whereas buying of physical um, and demand from the East is strong. Yep. And that seems to be exactly where we are now. Yep. We had a washout in sentiment. We had basically a 20% correction from the, the high in August 2020. Um, so I think there's, as you say, you know, no one's got a crystal ball, but there's yep. a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Yeah, yeah. All right, look, Jasper, thanks so much for coming in. Um, really enjoyed the chat and uh, let's do it again soon. Great to see you, Jordan. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.